Welcome, Matrix members. As time creeps forward, it is common for us to feel trapped in our bodies. When I say that, it seems as if we become stiffer every year. Finding new ways to stretch out and move our bodies seems like the right thing to do. However, our guest, Yogi Aaron, will show us a less common perspective about yoga and how stretching is killing us. Our guest, yoga, Yogi Aaron, is one of the most sought after teachers today. Yogi Aaron is trailblazing a new path in the yoga world known for his unorthodox perspectives on stretching and flexibility and how both cause more harm than good. His teachings aim to help as many people as possible live pain-free lives to realize yoga's true intention. He is the creator of the revolutionary approach to yoga, applied yoga anatomy and muscle activization, Ayama, and the online platform, The Yogi Club, host of the yoga podcast, Stop Stretching, author of Autobiography of a Naked Yogi, and the forthcoming book, Stop Stretching, a new yogic approach to master your body and live pain-free, and is the co-owner of Blue Asa Yoga Retreat and Spa in Costa Rica, where he leads the Yogi Club Yoga Teacher Training Immersions year-round for students all across the globe. Yogi said, Yogi Aaron's sense of humor, contagious laugh, con and courageous adventurous spirit and healing journey of overcoming pain and discovering and living his true purpose makes him stand out and favored leading yoga teacher today. Follow our show and bookmark our podcast so you don't miss out on our fantastic Matrix mentors. Welcome to the Organic Matrix, A Yogi Aaron. Thank you so much for having me here, Samantha. I really appreciate it. It's an honor. What is your personal experience with chronic pain? And can you tell us about your journey of healing from chronic pain? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I started yoga when I was 18 years old. And I started yoga because I really wanted to become more limber. As I looked around at older people, quote unquote, I noticed that there was two kinds of older people. One type was kind of like people who were stiff and just didn't have a lot of mobility uh, in their body. And then the other kind of people that sort of had this vitality and youthfulness. And what I perceived in that was this kind of range of motion. They were able to move. And so immediately I went to, oh, flexibility. <laughs> Incidentally, when I was doing um, stop stretching the podcast and I interviewed a lot of people and I said why do you think flexibility is important and so many people kind of reflected back to me what was in my brain but I just didn't put into words was that so many people associate flexibility with youthfulness with um with movement with um with vitality with health you know, if you look at pictures on a lot of health magazines, it's people doing some sort of like, you know, stretchy kind of pose. And so with like those people, when I was that age, um, when I was 18, I kind of put those dots together. And so the natural conclusion that I came to was yoga. And if you ask a lot of people, like, you know, why they do yoga, it's always like, I'm doing yoga to stretch. And I do my, you know, my weights to work out. I've, um, you know, I bicycle for cardio and I do yoga to stretch. And so that was exactly why I started doing yoga. I was like, I've got to stretch, you know, let's just do a class once a week or twice a week to become more limber. The interesting thing was when I was 18 years old, and this was the kind of like, the moment that things started to shift in my body dramatically was that I hurt my back badly. I threw my lower back out. And I mean, as an 18 year old, who's very active um, at that time, I remember it kind of being like, you know, WTHF, like, <laughs> like this is, I'm 18 years old. This should not be happening to me. I, you know, am I going to be destined for this kind of life? And so what I did was I started doing more yoga and <laughs> kind of like, you know, deal with those kind of negative effects of, of the pain. And, you know, the yoga would definitely make me feel better. But what started to happen um, was that I started having more problems. As I 
you know, and, and I really got into yoga more and more and more throughout the years. By the time I was 29, I was dealing with a lot of chronic back problems though. And, um, I started dealing with knee problems. I remember I had to stop hiking because every time I started like going into the mountains within a couple of kilometers or miles <laughs> that my knees would start to, um, develop this kind of searing pain. And then I, um, right around the age of like 35, my neck got so bad, uh, that I ended up having to go and see a, um, a physical therapist. His name is Eric Stiebel. And it was kind of interesting. It was kind of like my, one of my light bulb moments. It wasn't the only one. It wasn't the big one, but it was one of, one of many little ones where I went to go see him and I, my pain was like nine out of 10. And after he finished working on me, it dropped down to like a one, two out of 10, which is really remarkable. And it stayed like that. Like a lot of times I would go and see a massage therapist and I would feel better, but the pain would never, the pain would always come back a couple of hours later. With Eric, the pain never really came back. I mean, it eventually did because I had to, I didn't do the exercises he told me to do. It was my fault. But but I would go back and see him and he always did the same thing. So I knew it wasn't just a one-off. And eventually I um, my back got so bad um, that I ended up in the hospital and they wanted to do a steroid injection in my spine. But the orthopedic surgeon told me that I would probably need to have a spinal fusion. And I mean, I was like, you know, at that time I was about 45 and I'm like, this is crazy. I, I'm, I'm a young, relatively speaking, a young man, I should not need this. And I'm a yoga teacher. I understand body biomechanics. I understand alignment. I'm doing all of this stuff and I kept, keep stretching to make it feel good, but I'm feeling worse. And so right after that happened, I went to go see Eric. And I actually spent eight days with him and he worked on me every single day. But one of the things that I came to understand with Eric is that I needed to work more on activating my muscles and by stretching them, I was literally killing myself. And so that was how I got into all of this. Um, I went on to study uh, muscle activation. And then the big question was, how do I start to integrate this into the yoga world? Because I knew that being a yoga teacher, I had to change, I had to flip my own script on flexibility. Um, if you talk to any yoga teacher today, you know, under their breath, they will tell you that yoga is stretching, basically. And um, even though a lot of yoga teachers say that yoga is not about how flexible you are, what are they teaching? Flexibility. So that's what I'm all about now is flipping the script and let's approach this from a different paradigm because the old script isn't working and we're, you know, fulfilling the definition of insanity, repeating the same thing over and over, trying to get a different result, and it's not working. I love that you're reinventing the perspective on yoga in the yoga world. In, and I, and I, I say this like more westernized pop version of yoga because from I love yoga. I got into yoga um, when I was a wrestler in high school because it used to help me with my injuries and the range sure. of motion. And I would, you know, when I was studying it, I never got to join like a yoga academy and really learn it. But what it helped me was it helped me activate underdeveloped muscles in my adolescent body. And that's why yeah. it helped me with wrestling because it gave me more body awareness that I needed to prevent injury. Um, so the fundamental roots of yoga is about strengthening and, and strengthening, uh, skeletal muscle, right. In like India, but what you said is like a serious topic in the yoga world where yoga was brought into this country, but because of pop culture, it's being viewed as these stretching and these exotic poses. And then someone who's just watching on Instagram may be inspired 
try to fold their body into these positions end up maybe really hurting themselves. They're not they're not being marketed the fundamental roots of this practice. And I like I love yoga because it looks like just a physical exercise, but really it's a whole spiritual journey where you you get to learn so much about yourself. Can you mm-hmm. tell us more about the spiritual perspectives on yoga as well? Absolutely. Um, I would also just kind of back up what you just said by just kind of reiterating too that asana postures is just a very small portion of sort of what traditional yoga is really about. And that the idea of asana in and of itself, the way that we understand asana today, postures is a new concept in the yoga world. It really, there really wasn't a lot of postures that were practiced. Um, And this sort of whole anthem of yoga postures is only, you know, 50 to 100 years old. Um, um, So that's one topic, but going back to your question that, you know, a lot of people ask, or a lot of people make these kind of grandiose statements um, about what yoga is about. And I do that all the time as well, so I'm as guilty. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, there's kind of two themes of yoga, which actually kind of if you kind of pull out 40,000 feet and look at all spiritual traditions, you actually say, see that they're saying the same two things. The first thing about yoga, and I would even say, you know, Christianity, um, Hinduism, um, um, Islam, uh, Judaism, I think that we can say that they're all really saying the same message, that life is a precious gift and we shouldn't waste it on stupid things, petty things, that, that we're here to fulfill life's purpose. You know, we're here to kind of stretch the boundaries of, you know, our human mind and reach literally for the stars. Literally. I mean, one of my favorite speeches in history, there's a few, but one of my favorite speeches in history is by JFK. We're going to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And I think like that embodies so much of of what yoga is telling us, like, Go for it. Do big things. Find out who you are and stretch the capacity of who you are. But but there's a problem to that. And again, I believe that all spiritual traditions recognize this truth, that there's a problem with that is that we get in our own way, that we are the manifestors, the architects and creators of our own self-created suffering. And so yoga really... It, and, and I'm a yogi, so I'm always going to be pro yoga more than any other spiritual practice. So no shade, no shade to anybody else. But I think that yoga, more than any other practice, um, really kind of directly, directly head on addresses the causes of suffering, tells us exactly what how we're messing up, and what we need to do about it. And so that's why I love teaching yoga so much is because of those we can do those two things in dual action it's not like you have to do one first and then do the other one it's like we're constantly mindfully yes i'm reaching for the stars and i'm you know um removing my suffering i'm getting to work on myself constantly we actually see that when people kind of focus on one in the yoga world um, a lot of people just focus on trying to feel better without dealing with their stuff and it creates a lot of problems um i'll just leave that one alone but it it just creates a lot of problems um and so we have to be mindful of two both of them and that recognize yeah i've got some work to do um and and i'm also pushing myself and i think that's just such a beautiful idea that that life is such a precious gift and every moment that we spend doing, you know, it, that we're in our stuff, it's just like, it's wasted time. You know, we can celebrate our, our um, failures. We can celebrate our victimness. We can celebrate, but that's, who wants to do that? It's like, every time we do that, we're just, it's a moment gone in our life. 
So, um, so light, that's the beginning. It's like yoga is now and in, in Sutra one and don't waste it. <laughs> that's it in a nutshell. Um, if you, you know, the whole idea of posture came out around eh, more or less a thousand years after the yoga sutras was written. And so right around like it was right 800 AD, more or less. That's when we started seeing like yoga postures being practiced. And it was really a way for people to access the potential energy, that potential universal energy that flows through everything in life. And we call it in yoga, we call it prana. So prana animates all of life. And within us is this limitless source of prana and so by practicing posture it was a way for us for the lay person for simpler people to be able to access it that we didn't need to go to a cave for all of our life that you know we could live a life um, in the real world that we could have jobs and we could do these postures to begin reorganizing that prana and direct that animated force into fulfilling life's purpose I love that. Um, it, it reminds me of uh, how when, like in New Age philosophy, we consider like Buddha and like certain yogis, like thought leaders in the world to be of like Christ consciousness. And so it reminds me of like bringing this beautiful wisdom to Gentiles, right? Mm. Welcoming it to for us to be able to harness this vitality as well. And I love the way you describe it. I, 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 it resonates with, with me and like my personal experience with yoga too. It's just uh, so much to be aware of. There's so much to be grateful for, especially when we start looking within, start really like letting ourselves feel our bodies and where we're at. Yeah. I actually believe that what you just said, you didn't say, I don't think you said the word gratitude, but when, what you just said made me think of gratitude. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we look at the teachings of Buddha and Jesus and, and a lot of the great saints, really what we're seeing is them instructing us to practice gratitude, like wholehearted gratitude, and to perpetually live in that because people will flip between gratitude and entitlement, like at the drop of a hat. And when we're really in gratitude, we're constantly in that practice. We don't flip back and forth. There is no moving back and forth. And I'm a firm and staunch believer um, through personal experience and working with my students that the solution to most of life's problems, and if not all, the big statement I know, but uh, most of life's problems is making sincere effort to be living in gratitude. I mean, could you imagine if our politicians got up on the debate stage and just talked about what they were grateful for? <laughs> Would change the conversation completely. <laughs> I like. I hope the the right person hears this and takes that flip because I think it would be the mature move in the direction our country needs. I would much rather vote for somebody who's transparent and says, yeah. "Hey, I I could see where I align with my competition, and this yeah. is how I would take it if I were to have it in my own hands." It'd be it would be like Dale Carnegie would like celebrate in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> How did you come to create your yoga approach, applied yoga anatomy and muscle activization? And I love the name it like rolls off the tongue. Ayama. <laughs> Ayama. Yeah. Ayama. One of the questions I often get is, um, is Ayama actually a Sanskrit word? And the answer is yes and no. Um, the word yama, we actually see it in the eight limb path. Yama means the restraints that we practice in life. And so anytime in Sanskrit, you put a, a before a word, it's the opposite. So it's to live life without restraint or to live without restraint. And another way of saying that is freedom um, to live free. And I didn't plan that. Like I did not intentionally like I want what's a great acronym, you know, and then make the title. I just made the title. And then one day I realized like, oh yeah, that means a yama. And there's the word, you know, yama. So it, it kind of, in, in Yogi Aaron's world, it means like freedom <laughs> to live free. And um, 
I, so I was telling you the story that I went to go see Eric and I spent eight days with him. And one of the things that Eric was doing with me was sort of advanced muscle activation techniques on me. And one of the ways that they do that is they build your muscles up. They build that neuromuscular connection between the brain and the muscle. And then they do something to stress that connection. And then they rebuild it and stress it and rebuild it and stress it. And when I'm talking about stress, by the way, I'm not talking about anything like, you know, invasive. It's just moving the body slowly in different, at different access points. And, and, Again, it's very passive, it's very gentle, but it has a detrimental effect on that neuromuscular connection. It's a passive stress that shuts muscles down. And when I saw him doing this to me, and I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example, because if any of your listeners do yoga, they probably have experienced this in a yoga class where they're lying in Shavasana. Shavasana is corpse pose, where you're lying on your back, and the teacher lovingly, not maliciously, lovingly comes up and grabs your ankles and just kind of sways your legs side to side, holding the feet. Well, that's actually one of the techniques to shut muscles down. (laughs) And when Eric did that to me, I was like, oh my God, if this is as easy as it gets to shut muscles down, what about all of the other postures that we're doing and the things that are more I'm going to say passively aggressive. And I made a commitment right then and there that I, A, I was never going to adjust a student into a pose again. I was never going to do a hands-on manipulated correction. And number two, I would never teach stretching again. And because I just saw how quickly it was to shut muscles down. So that was the first step. And then the second thing that happened shortly after that was I felt like I really wanted to learn more um, in my own life. And so I started looking around at different courses and I thought, why don't I check out muscle activation technique? At that time, a lot of their courses had moved online and I talked to Eric. He said, you know what, Aaron, you're going to just eat this up. This is, you're going to have a great time. And you're going to learn a lot and it's really going to be easy for you because you're going to get it. So I went into it just like thinking like at worst, I'll learn something new. And at best, maybe I'll get some hacks and tips into my yoga world. And when I got into the course, I realized very quickly that everything I thought about yoga was wrong. Um, and, And when I say yoga, I'm talking about right now, the asanas, not the philosophy the philosophy or the, pra- the the philosophical practices. I'm talking about just the way that we approach asana, the way that we approach posture. So that's just to be very clear on that point. Um, and I just decided like, you know, I took Greg Roscoff's uh, muscle activation technique. And to this day, I'm so thankful to him. He has invested his whole life into developing this technique But the one missing connection, the one missing link was for yoga teachers. They're not yogis there. Um, God bless them. They're not yoga people at all. And and that's that's completely fine. They, They stay in their lane. But what I wanted to do was kind of see how can I start to integrate this? And one of the ways that I did that was, um, you know, like one of the most popular poses, for example, is triangle pose in in the yoga world, uh, trikonasana, uh, triangle pose. And so if your listeners don't understand triangle pose, Google it, Um, it'll pop up right away. But if you don't have time to Google it, it's basically just a side bender. So if you're sitting and you think about like your left shoulder coming towards your left hip bone and you don't, you're not, you know, bringing your right shoulder forward, displacing your right shoulder forward, that's a pure side um, bending pose. And so I started to look at like all of the different ways that we move the spine. And I started to see like, oh, there's a correlation. So like with, with triangle pose, which is a side bender pose, it's a lateral. So those are called laterals. Sometimes we do poses in yoga that we call twists. We get twisted up, baby. And so we do a twist. And what is that? What is the action of that? Well, those are trunk rotators. Those are spinal rotators. Sometimes we do um, forward bends, like a seated forward fold. 
those are trunk flexors, you know, and then we do back bends in yoga, which are called, you know, biomechanically uh, trunk um, back extensors, trunk extensors. So the, the, the kind of like switch for me was like, instead of like when we come into triangle pose, which is a 